Thank, thank you. And um, as soon as I got up to shut the door in my office here, someone started cutting down a tree in my neighborhood, I swear. So uh, if the noise, I don't hear them right now. So if the noise gets bad, somebody pop me up a chat and I'll shut the window. I've already shut the door. So uh, Dr. Haas, uh, the Department of Sociology and Anthropology and the College of Arts and Letters, uh, especially Dean Charlene Gilbert for taking the time, energy, and commitment to bringing this series uh, to the to the college, to the university. The commitment means a lot. Uh, and of course, I want to thank my department, uh, Women's and Gender Studies, our excellent faculty and staff, and especially the students. Thank you for coming, and especially in my two face-to-face -face classes this semester, who are working so hard to stay safe. I, it's, I so appreciate it. has truly made value, value the time we have together in class a lot, so thanks. Um, it's a deep honor to be part of the series, uh, and I, I don't take it lately, and I, I hope you find the talk worthy. Um, one more thank you. I'd like, like to also thank Dr. Michael uh, Stouch, who was, whose talk last week on community policing in Detroit uh, was really informative, um, presented obviously well researched and thoughtful. And um, my talk is quite a bit different, but I hope we'll find some points of um, convergence and uh, opportunity to talk about that um, in the Q&A. Well, while Dr. Stouch uh, dedicated his talk to the protesters who are out um, making a statement from their hearts. Uh, with their feet uh, in some challenging conditions right now. Um, and I definitely want to acknowledge their work also. I want to dedicate this talk to the artists, the writers, the singers, the dancers, the mural painters, the uh, Zoom choir leaders, and um, all the other creative people who are finding ways to make their art uh, out of this uh, moment and out of their pain and their hope um, and as a way of challenging us to get better. Um, uh, as uh, the late Congressman John Lewis said, you know, they're out there making good trouble and um, may they continue and, and maybe be victorious. Uh, finally, um, before I get into the heart of my talk, um, also in response to Dr. Stouch's talk last week, uh, in his opening remarks, he acknowledged the reality of indigenous people whose lands we're all living on, um, their ancestral homelands. Um, and he also expressed some concern that a gesture of acknowledgement could become rote, uh, something that we just do as a, a gesture, maybe that kind of becoming an empty gesture. So I, I want to acknowledge that concern and um, recognize the extent and gravity of, of what it means. Um, and I want to recognize um, our colleague, uh, Dr. Barbara Alice Mann in the Honors College, who's a renowned Iroquois scholar, uh, who has a book about this land that we are on now called Land of the Three Miamis, and I highly recommend her, all of her work, and that book in particular. Um, I think that the uh, his, Dr. Stouch is reminding us that as people concerned with justice, racial justice, we have to do more than acknowledge theft of indigenous lands. We have to conceptualize strategies for justice that take responsibility for the crimes of the past so we're not repeating them today. So our actions in the present respect uh, what we've learned. Um, so the world we're creating by our actions in the present demonstrates our understanding of what we've learned and how we are going to create inclusive justice. Uh, I invite you to think about what that might mean in light of the material from Audre Lorde that I'm going to share with you today. And I'm so sorry about the slides. I don't know what happened in the translation, but it should have been my name that got cut off, but it was hers. Uh, so I added to the title the word art which uh, back in the summer when I volunteered and asked to participate in this, uh, I, I, I didn't explicitly articulate that. And I think as I have watched 
media coverage of these movements, uh, of all the movements and the, the response to the murders I have, the police murder, state sanctioned murder, um, I have really grown to appreciate how, the role of art, not that I didn't appreciate it before, but really noticing it, uh, the significance of artists as truth tellers in our, our movements. So uh wanted to note that correction. I'm going to try to talk about all these topics, a little bit about Audre Lorde, for those of you who aren't familiar with her, um, a little bit about myself and my understanding of my role as an aspiring white ally in promoting racial justice, about intersectionality, and I want to read and comment on a number of her poems, uh, as many as I can, and still leave time for questions. Um, and hopefully in the Q&A we can talk about uh, the relevance of her work, her art, to the movement of racial, the racial reckoning that we're uh, pushing forward right now in U.S. America. Um, a little bit about Audre Lorde to start. Let me see if I, yeah. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with her, she was born in 1934 in Harlem, New York City. Her parents, Byron and Linda, were immigrants. Um, they came in the 1920s uh, after selling everything they owned to pay for the trip. Um, her mother was from Grenada, from a relatively prominent family, uh, but also not a family of wealth. Um, her father was uh, from Barbados, and he was born um, to a couple that was not married and uh, was raised by his father in Barbados. Uh, her mother was light-skinned and her father was darker-skinned. And it's a, a, a situation and a, a experience that she comments on a lot in her work. Um, she grew up the third of three daughters. Um, she was the troublemaker. The, uh, she self-described as fat. And she was the darkest skinned of her three sisters and also nearly legally blind. She said of herself, functionally blind without her glasses at 10 feet. Uh, she did, that was not discovered until she was four years old. She didn't talk much until that time either. And she also learned to read and write the same year. So four was a renaissance year for Audre Lorde. Um, she always loved poetry, uh, interestingly, especially the romantic poets. Uh, despite being perceived as a behavior problem in her Catholic schools, she excelled um, academically and went to Hunter College High School, which was linked to Hunter College, where she attended. Um, she published poetry as a young person, including in Seventeen magazine, which is baffling to think about. Uh, she left home early, um, somewhat estranged from her parents, and put herself through college working as a librarian, which was her major library science. She also worked in a factory cutting crystals to make uh, x-ray machines, and she has, in her writing, linked that to her later cancer diagnosis. She also, at that time, was exploring her sexuality, um, her lesbian identity, uh, which solidified during the year in Mexico uh, as an exchange student. She came back to the U.S. in 1955 um, and settled into what she called the gay girl life in Greenwich Village. Her autobiographical novel, Zami, a new spelling of my name, chronicles those years in depth. She earned a master's in library science of from Columbia University in 1961. And much to the dismay of her friends and surprise of her friends, she married a white man, Ed Rollins, in 1961, uh, 1962, sorry, uh, no, 61. And they had uh, two children together. Um, and that was sort of despite Lord being a self identified lesbian most of her adult life. Um, in addition to working as a librarian, she was writing uh, her first book, uh, The First Cities, came out in 1968. Uh, that year, she was also a writer in residence at Tugel College in Mississippi. Uh, and she met um, Frances Clayton, who 
um, a white professor there who he had a relationship, a long-term relationship with, and they eventually moved to Long Island and raised the kids together out there. Um, Clayton also played a major role first uh, about cancer, which was diagnosed in uh, 78. Um, she, in her later years, after her second diagnosis in 84, she, um, they sold the house in Long Island, spent more and more time in the Caribbean with Gloria Joseph, uh, I believe sociology professor, another academic, um, uh, uh, the Caribbean, and now she died. Um, she moved there permanently before she died. Uh, she taught around the country, lectures in Europe, um, Caribbean. Um, she just lectured all over the world. Uh, she was one of the first women of color to come out in the movement, both the Black Liberation Movement and the women's liberation struggles. She continued to speak from all of her identities, which is one of the things that, that made her so significant to so many uh, writers and activists across those communities, young lesbians, lesbians of color, gay men, anti-racist feminists, black liberationists, disability scholars, uh, she uh, anti-colonial scholars. Uh, her work spoke to the connections between our oppressions um, and her thinking influenced generations of liberation activists who came to consciousness after her publications came out. Um, from from South Africa to Burma, her words are so profound. I all I often find myself thinking, oh, there, there's another Audre Lorde bumper sticker. Um, uh, there, the your silence will not protect you. The master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. Um, it's not our differences that divide us. It's our inability to recognize, accept, and celebrate those differences. And of course, the, the poster we have in uh, U-Haul 41, uh, when I dare to be powerful, to live, my, to use my strength in the service of my vision, then it becomes less and less important whether I'm afraid. There's no end to the Audre Lorde favorite quote game. So I'm gonna stop with those. And if there's one message to take away from my talk today, it's read Audre Lorde. Read all of Audre Lorde, then read it again. But I'm gonna read a little bit of it. Uh, so I wanna talk a little bit about myself. Um, and this is one of those slides that got messed up in the, uh, translation because it's part of a line from her work and the R should be aligned with the I. I don't want to talk a lot about myself, but I want to speak a little bit about why I'm here, especially to any of you who are young, especially young folks who are sitting in on the call who may feel uncertain about their place in the movement of racial justice. Because I think if you're feeling uncertain about where you stand, that's a good thing. It means that you know that you don't belong in the center. You don't. And that is good But that doesn't mean you as white people or as people who possess care and concern about justice don't have any place. It means that we have to use our positionality to do the work that we can do. I recently had a student in one of my classes, a student of color, say uh, that he's sick of white women talking about women of color. And I thought, yes, I can see that. So I want to say why I'm still talking about Audre Lorde after all these years. Primarily, it's because we need these words. We need Audre Lorde's words in our discourse as much as possible. She herself challenged people to read her work, especially white women who said they weren't comfortable teaching it, that they're comfortable teaching Shakespeare, they ought to be able to teach her work also. She also explicitly stated at the end of her life that she wanted her words to be there for people to use. 
And that's uh, really resonated for me because her words have been so important to me throughout my life. Um, and mostly, I hope, in positive ways. Uh, so part of my commitment to Audre Lorde um, in writing a doctoral dissertation about her and literally, in some senses, building a career on her words, on her back, was to share her words as much as I can and to continue to fight for the uh, issues and things that she cared about, which are also things that I care about. So I want to say that I know the turf of Audre Lorde's studies is hallowed ground, and I walk it with all the humility, respect, and awareness within me. Um, and it's my job as an asp aspiring white ally to take the words of people of color seriously, to seek them out, both in person and in writing, to take them to heart and to keep learning and growing in my capacity to be an ally, to stand with, beside, behind, wherever I'm asked to be in cooperation, collaboration, and collusion with movements for racial justice. We find our way by being good, thoughtful students. I can say more about this in the Q&A if you have questions, but that's enough about me. So are you ready? That's a line from this poem that I love by Audre Lorde called Now. Woman power is black power, is he power, is always feeling. My heart beats as my eyes open, as my hands move. As my mouth speaks, I am. Are you ready? It's interesting that if things go as planned in this presentation, I'm going to start with now and end with today. Uh, and we can talk together about what that journey from now to today might mean. Uh, I feel compelled to pick short poems for this talk, but I also really, really love this poem. Um, I think that she makes the link between gender and race and dehumanization as well as humanity uh, so simply and clearly in the first couple of lines. Um, and in asserting her humanity, she also claims her body, um, her heart, her eyes opening, seeing what's going on around her, and then uh, her mouth speaking as, as a writer, as an artist, that's, that's her activism. And so she's, she puts her hand to the work and she puts her mouth to the work. So, so I really love, love that. And then, um, asking, uh, are you ready at the end? It, it, to me, it is not a question at all. It is a warning. It is a, uh, an assertion. Uh, you know, you better be ready. I'm coming. Uh, and so I, I think it's a challenge and I think she's, she's good at challenging us. So I, I really love this piece. Um, part of what I wanted to reference today is, uh, how I think Lord, um, and lots of other folks, um, ask us to think about intersectionality in maybe a way that, uh, sometimes gets overly simplified. And, um, what I mean by that is I, two things. One, I think that we, we tend to articulate our intersectionality as a, like a laundry list of identities that we um, carry or that are placed on us. And you know the list, race, class, sexual orientation, gender, ability, sexuality, language, immigrant status, religion, um, and no and I'm going to say, and so on, with no disrespect to the multitude of things that could be in that, and so on. Um, and yes, intersectionality is about our experience of all of those things inside us. But I think that um, feminists of color, especially African American feminists, have been telling us for a long time that we also have to look at the social structures that create, define, inhibit, oppress, benefit, privilege, those categories. That it's not just about our internal experience of the category, but it is also about, it is also a social experience, a, a structural experience, a cultural experience, an economic experience, a family experience. So we experience intersectionality for sure in our, inside our bodies, in our identities. 
but we also experience it in the social systems that we live in and operate in. And I think um, from from Sojourner Truth's 1951 Ain't I a Woman speech, where she was basically uh, challenging uh, those attendees at that suffrage uh, event that femininity does not define, you know, traditional white femininity does not define how I am understood in the world and I am, again, not really a question. Um, from her to the Combahee River Collective statement in 77 uh, about uh, the multiple interlocking systems of oppression um, to Patricia Hill Collins talking about the matrix of privilege and oppression to Crenshaw's, um, you know, sort of infamous, infamous now um, uh, articulation in 1989 of the term intersectionality. Uh, I think the challenge has been to understand that as a an experience that one has inside themselves and as a set of structural realities that impact us and can harm and benefit us. And I think um, these are, to me, um, the heart of uh, our experience with both oppression and privilege. And we were asked to do what we can to uh, end oppression and uh, spread privilege, um, uh, expand them. It, it is not simple. Who said it was simple? There are so many roots to the tree of anger that sometimes the branches shatter before they bear. Sitting in netics, the women rally before they march, discussing the problematic girls they hire to make them free. An almost white counterman passes a waiting brother to serve them first, and the ladies neither notice nor reject the slighter pre pleasures of their slavery. But I, who am bound by my mirror as well as my bed, see causes in color as well as sex, and sit here wondering which me will survive all these liberations. There's so much talk about it in this poem. Uh, but I, what I, what I want to focus on is, I want to focus on it as an example of Lord's artistic exploration of intersectionality. Not only hers, but also the counterman, uh, who, who passes over the brother to wait on the white women about the difficulty of his position, um, of servitude and the complex relationship to solidarity that that represents, um, that he has to, uh, I, to me, his choice is about the difficulty of solidarity uh, and the irony um, of, of the ignorance of the white women who are busy complaining about the, the girls. And, and I notice that she calls them women. Um, uh, so could comment on that as well, uh, that they're complaining about their girls, presumably brown-skinned girls who are nannying, taking care of their kids so that these women can go make women free, and that they're so oblivious to their own privilege that they don't notice uh, the colorism in front of them and their race and classism in their language and in their attitude. Um, I've often wondered about these, this, uh, the four lines at the top of the slide here, um, she's bound by her mirror, her bed, her color, and her sex. The structure of the sentence is not clear whether these are two things, sexism and racism, or four things, colorism, sexuality, race, and gender. And um, She's not here to ask, so we'll, we'll leave it there. And then, of course, the, the weariness, irony, um, and humor in the last lines, like which which one of me is going to survive all these liberations? And of course, that that she is all of those things at once. Um, it, it, I think for me, it situates Lord in this experience as with the women, um, but also separate from them. And for those of you who know her work, that her famous book of essays, Sister Outsider, this I think is a representation of that concept uh, in in her poetry.
this is another slide that got a little messed up in the uh, uh, transition to Blackboard. So sorry, some of the lines are cut off there. Um, this is just to say uh, she didn't spare the, the uh, Black Arts Movement any any uh, critique as well. Of course, I already got my pages out of order here. Hold on a second. Um, um, she also targeted the Black Power Movement and Hard Love Rock to explain. Uh, I did hear her read this, but I'm not going to be able to do it justice, but I'll give it a go. Listen, brother, love you, love you, love you, love you. Dig me a different colored grave. We are both lying side by side in the same place where you put me down deeper still. We are aloneness, unresolved by weeping, sacked cities not rebuilt by slogans, by rhetorical pricks picking the lock that has always been open. Black is not beautiful, baby, beautiful, baby, beautiful, let me begin. It is not being screwed twice at the same time from on top as well as from my side. What I like about this piece is the, the plain language, the straightforward critique through an intersectional lens. This sexism is not beautiful blackness. And from Lord's vantage point, it is not okay. As a critique of sexism of her brother, it nods to her critique of the black power movement the authors of the Black is Beautiful slogan, in which women were leading everywhere, but also often expected to take a back seat in public, especially in white controlled media moments in favor of the male leaders. It also critiques the everyday sexism of heteropatriarchy in the community, a problem she addressed throughout her life in poetry and prose. I love that the lock that the rhetorical prick tried to prick open was open all along. A statement about, I think, women's ability to work for the cause, maybe, and also to work for ourselves as well. It was her positionality as a feminist, a woman, a lesbian, that facilitated this vision and enabled this critique. And of course, such critique was not always welcome, but it did not stop her. One more in this series of her poems on inter intersectional experience and critique. It's especially relevant to me or to us, I think, because it addresses police violence directly. And since that's and, um, so much on our minds in the wake of the ongoing stream of state violence against African Americans, um, you know, Trayvon to Brianna Boyd, Brianna Taylor, sorry, George Floyd, and Jacob. And, uh, you know, I haven't been on the news today, but uh, I, I, ha I hesitate to guess. Um, this piece is called uh, The Same Death Over and Over, Lullabies Are for Children. It's the small deaths in the supermarket, she said, trying to open my head with her neat white cleaver trying to tell me how her pain met mine, halfway between the smoking ruins in a black neighborhood of Los Angeles and the bloody morning streets of child-killing New York. Her poem reached like an arc across the country. And I'm trying to hear you, I said, roaring with my pain in a pre-dawn city as open season on black children where my worst lullaby goes on over and over. I'm not fighting you, I said, but it's the small deaths in the gutter that are unmaking us all. And the white cop who shot down 10-year-old Clifford Glover did not fire because he saw a girl. This piece directly implicates white feminism, the kind of feminism that draws parallels between 19th century white married women as legal chattel of their husbands and chattel slavery. 
those who make universal claims about women's oppression without distinctions of race or class, sexuality or gender. And the murder of Clifford Glover that drives her rage, the state-sanctioned murder of children of color, was a force in her heart then as it is now. What I especially love about this poem is Lit's articulation of her effort to hear the white woman through the pain roaring in her own ear, the compassion, the understanding, situated side by side with the critique of the woman's lack of understanding. is a powerful juxtaposition, both for the lesson it offers the, the white woman and white readers, but also for anyone who is trying to work on social justice issues. It's about our capacity for compassion and our ability to help others see what they don't see. It does call out with the painful note at the end. The cop didn't fire because he saw a girl, but it also calls in. I hear you. I want to understand you. And most powerfully, I want you to understand me. We're all implicated. This is both challenging and embracing, and I think it's quite important for us. I know I've made the point about Lord's intersectionality with the poems I've shared, but I want to share one more in a similar vein, because it, I think it's an, a transition and an addition, including her sexuality and her identity as an artist, uh, which are both important aspects of her intersectional experience. It's a full I'm going to read all four parts and then just focus on the last one. There's much to say about the first three parts, too, and we can return to it obviously in the Q&A if you would like. And it's called The Poet Who Happens to be Black and The Black Poet Who Happens to be a Woman. One, I was born in the gut of blackness from between my mother's particular thighs. The waters broke upon blue-flowered linoleum and turned to slush in the Harlem cold, 10 p.m. on a full moon's night. My head crested round as a clock. You were so dark, my mother said. I thought you were a boy. Two. The first time I touched my sister, alive, I was sure the earth took note. But we were not new. False skin peeled off like gloves of fire, booked flame. I was stripped to the tips of my fingers, her song written into my palms, my nostrils, my belly. Well home in a language I was pleased to relearn. Three. No cold spirit ever strolled through my bones on the corner of Amsterdam Avenue. No dog mistook me for a bench, nor a tree, nor a bone. No lover envisioned my plump brown arms as wings, nor misnamed me Condor. But I can recall without counting, eyes canceling me out like an unpleasant appointment, postage due, stamped in yellow, red, purple, any color except black. And, and woman alive. Four, I cannot recall the words of my first poem, but I remember a promise I made my pen, never to leave it lying in somebody else's blood. I want to just focus on the last section. I should just shut up. There's really nothing more to be said. Um, but I won't. Um, this last section where she talks about herself as an artist, um, a writer with an explicitly political edge to her work, she clearly and powerfully asserts her intention to do no harm and also recognizes the power of art, her political ends, her race and social justice. Um, again, just mentioning what I said earlier about the kinds of art that we're seeing emerging, created, the creativity of what we're seeing emerging right now at this moment. 
I just think that's a powerful and important reminder. Um, before I, I don't know if I've gone over time, um, I want to address two other aspects of her work and her identities and preoccupations. Um, the fact that she lived a long time with cancer and um, and that has been articulated in her prose, but also in some of her most amazing and moving poetry. And that also, I think she, there was a thread of environmentalism that ran through her work. I'm just going to touch on this briefly. Our colleagues in disability studies um, have shared how influential Audre Lorde's work has been for their um, field. And I think some of her most beautiful poetry was written at the end of her life uh, about living with illness. Um, I want to share just one quote, and it's a little lengthy from A Burst of Light, which is one of her published journals that she wrote about cancer, um, about this moment of um, what it means to be aware of, of dying. Sometimes we are best with, blessed with, oh, sorry, I knew that was going to happen. Sometimes we are blessed with being able to choose the time and arena and the manner of our revolution. But more usually, we must do battle wherever we are standing. It does not matter too much if it is in the radiation lab, the streets, the welfare department, or the classroom. The real blessing is to be able to use whoever I am, wherever I am, in concert with as many others as possible, or alone if needs be. This is no longer a time of waiting. It is a time for the real work's urgencies. It is a time enhanced by an iron reclamation of what I call the burst of light, the inescapable knowledge of my own physical limitation. Metabolized and integrated into the fabric of my days, that knowledge makes the particulars of what is coming seem less important. So uh, the poem that I've selected to share, this is one of my all-time favorite poems of Lord's, um, called Smelling the Wind, and it was um, written at the, in, in the very, toward the very end of her life. Rushing headlong into new silence, your face dips on my horizon, the name of a cherished dream. Riding my anchor one sweet season to cast off on another voyage. No reckoning allowed save the marvelous arithmetics of distance. My thesis theory, unconfirmed, is that this is written about and to Gloria Joseph, the woman that she spent the last few years of her life with. Um, she has a very beautiful line that uh, Joseph will go on and she'll, tra Lord will trail behind the comforting home um, uh, in another poem. And so I think that's what the cherished uh, one sweet season is. Um, but that rushing headlong into new silences pretty, I think, clearly about her imminent death. And the line that I love is this uh, marvelous arithmetics of distance. The idea that, uh, you know, we, we can't reckon. Of course, we can reckon distance if we have a point A and a point B. But uh, when someone dies, we don't really know what a point B is. And so it's just a marvelous arithmetics. And for me, that became a central metaphor for my understanding of Audre Lorde's conception of intersectional identity. Um, and, and so that marvelous arithmetic is really, for me, a, a challenge and a, um, a way of approaching the work we have to do. So I'm just going to end. I, it says I have 33 slides, but I don't. Um, and so this is my last uh, uh, point about her environmentalism. And this is just a tiny little uh, uh, line, but we have chosen each other and the edge of each other's battles. The war is the same. If we lose, someday women's blood will congeal upon a dead planet. If we win, there is no telling. We seek beyond history for a new and more possible meeting. And of course, uh, this is Audre Lorde's challenge to us. I am a woman, I am black, I am lesbian, I am myself, a black woman warrior poet doing my work, come to ask you, are you doing yours? And that's the end of my presentation. If you have questions or comments. Um... <laughs>
Great. Yes, that's my curtsy. I'm yes, I, thank you. That was excellent. Fascinating. Question. Oh, thanks. Everyone, you can either uh, click, click on your mic or you can, uh, if you want to post in chat. Hi, Sharon. Hi, everyone. This is Allie Day speaking. Can you hear me? Hello. Yes, I yep. can. Um, Sharon, thank you so much for sharing so much of Audre Lorde's poetry. It was really awesome to just be able to listen to those words right now. Um, one of the things that I've been struck with in my work um, around Lorde is, her, is how she inspired a generation of young Black queer male activists during the HIV epidemic. Um, mm -hmm. And and one of the things um, I think that was so inspiring um, is that she wrote about cancer as a social justice um, issue. Um, and she also, in bursts of light, connected it very um, critically to her work as an anti-apartheid activist. And so I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit about um, what you know about that work that she did or how she was connected to um, the South African activists um, in her work. Well, what comes to mind immediately is the um, spot in the film, um, I Am Your Sister, where the South African activist, and you're going to have to help me remember her name, it's Ellen, uh, where she says, your words are well known in South Africa. Your, your wisdom is um, known from us there. So I know that her uh, work was known and used. What I, uh, what I know, I mean, she did travel to Africa, but I honestly, I don't know if she ever went to South Africa, uh, or at least I can't remember. I remember other um, sort of parts of the, the journals that talk about her, or maybe it's in her biography that talks about her journeys. Um, so really, I think that's, um, you probably know a lot more about it than I do. I'm a little more familiar with the people in Berlin, the women in Berlin, the Afro German women using her work. Do you want to say something about that? No, I think I, I want to hear you talk about the Afro German stuff. Tell us about that. Yeah, you know, she was getting treatments in Germany um, and simultaneously. Um, experiencing a lot of racism there and started asking around about, you know, where, where, where are the women of color, you know, and um, did some organizing, some really powerful organizing there. And the Afro-German women's groups that formed from the inspiration of her talks and, and teaching there um, produced uh, books and produced a lot of activism and still I mean, there's a film I think I mean, you, you showed that in your um, in the DST film series a year or two ago um, so I think that uh, those those kinds of things I think happened everywhere I think even lesser known maybe similar um, talk and organizing happened in the Caribbean um, uh, she and Gloria Joseph did a lot of organizing down there and um, uh, connected uh, Caribbean feminists and worked on women's issues there. So I think that uh, maybe we can't really limit the influence to um, where we may have heard of it in, in Germany, but also it'd be interesting to know who in South Africa. I just remember in that film, uh, uh, that speaker saying how well known her work was there. Chip in if you want to say something else that I'm missing that you think is important. Sharon, it's awesome. Thank you so much. Sure. Anybody Hi, else? Dr. Sharon Barnes. May I ask a question? This is Rachel Dudley. <laughs> Hi, Dr. Rachel Dudley. 
So thank you so much for that brilliant presentation. And like Ali said, also in the comments are demonstrating um, the, the need for poetry, which is, she, she said is not a luxury, but an absolute yeah. necessity. I think we all needed that yes. refreshing reminder. I'm wondering as a Lord scholar, you know, as a, an Audre Lorde scholar, um, how has your relationship to Lord's work changed over time? Um, and, and what is your relationship to Lord's work now in this present moment that we find ourselves in? That is what st stood out to me is just the, the, um, the amount of time, the years that you spend uh, as, a, as a Lord scholar. And so I wanted your perspective, your long-term perspective um, in that respect, if you don't mind. No, that's, that's a delicious question. Um, I thank you for it. I think, um, so I would just say maybe what everybody else is saying about Lord in the present moment. And I think, you know, uh, it's interesting to me how many activists say they go to poetry when they're looking for inspiration. And I think that uh, volunteering to do this and or any time you get an opportunity to interact with the words of a deep thinker, um, you end up feeling lighter in your spirit. I mean, I I love talking about Audre Lorde and spirituality, for example, which is another journey I've been on. So. Um, Today, it's really about the inspiration and um, trying to remember to try to inspire my students. I, I think we, we kind of get in that rut with our heads down, trying to keep getting the work done. And we, we forget to try to also be inspiring. I, in our, Jane Caputi, who, um, it's so inspiring how smart and thoughtful and, how she connects such amazing issues together. So I think now it would be that. I think might be surprised maybe to know when I first started to really love Audre Lorde was um, I was kind of casting around for a dissertation topic and I wanted it to be political. I wanted it to be feminist and um, poetry was really my love. And then my sister um, became ill and died of breast cancer. and one of my mentors gave me a copy of the cancer journals and uh, she said, you know, it was Dr. Harriet Adams. She said, I, I don't know who used to be on the faculty here. She said, I don't know if this is going to hurt or help, but it just seemed like it might help. And um, it helped a lot. And so my, my real first heart connection to Audre Lorde's work was the cancer journals and her work about death, death and dying. And um, so then I went to her poetry and, and um, really just read all of it four or five times through and looked for big themes. And the big themes corresponded to some of those lines that you all are, some of those bumper stickers that you all are quoting. So um, I, I think that's, that's where it started. And, and then I think somewhere, you know, mid range, the, I read her critique of people who were wanted every single goddess and, and African uh, cultural tradition explained to them, I should say white people. And, um, I just got really interested in her spiritual journey and her use of, um, that those images and to me the marvelous arithmetics is about that too she's got this line about um she's harvesting everyone she's ever been uh for use in the current moment and so that for me that arithmetics is also how we carry in ourselves all of the selves that we've ever been. so um uh so yeah i'd say the spirituality has been a big, big in my journey and one more thing, um, the uh, transnational organizing. I know I didn't, I didn't knock that uh, Allie's question out of the park there, but I think it's kind of part of my intellectual journey that I probably because of Dr. Abdul Halim in our department. Um, you know, at some point I realized I should stop going to all the sessions on um, the stuff I already know about at the national conference, the international conferences and go to the sessions I don't know anything about. And so then I learned a lot more about the international 
um, women's movement and, and uh, diaspora women of color movements that that uh, I wouldn't say I know a lot about, but I would say are are really important to where I, to what I'm thinking about now. Okay, now I really am done. Thank you, Dr. Barnes. I appreciate that. This is Dwight. Oh, yeah. uh, this is not my okay. question, but I'm just reading one. One of my favorite Lord quotes is the one about the master's tools. Can you elaborate on that and how you see it inform the lens we should view the current uprising? Yeah, probably not as well as I could have 20 years ago, but um, I think it's historically been understood to mean that dominance is not the way to <laughs> thinking about the presidents telling the governors to dominate the protesters. <laughs> that that dominance is not the way to um, create a better world. And um, whether it be rhetorical dominance, um, violence. Um, Last night, um, Dr. Caputi was talking about it as rape mentality, extraction mentality, colonialist mentality. So I think, um, I feel like there's a, was a very specific context that she said it in. And I used to get really um, indignant about people not knowing that context. And now I can't remember it. <laughs> so I'm feeling mad at myself, but I feel the, the bigger point is that we can't use white supremacist capitalist patriarchy to destroy it. We can't use those tools. And um, it's a message I keep getting. Uh, Dr. Caputi was certainly saying it last night. So I think uh, recognizing, for example, that science, you know, the idea that science is as we understand it, that, that um, oral cultures don't have science, don't have philosophy, don't have thinking. Um, that, that the white supremacy is not going to solve this problem, solve our, any of our problems. If you please, if you please want to add something to that, please. Can you hear me? I'm having issues with my mic. That's why I typed the question. Oh. This is my idea. You're good. Okay. So um, I love that quote, and I like to use it, and I like to use it to remind individuals when they're talking about the uprising and ways um, to not miss the message, right? Because when you, you frame uprisings as stealing, is, 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 it makes the, the message illegitimate, right? Or like I think the mayor of Chicago a couple of weeks ago said that, um, looting and stealing and burning things, um, those are not legitimate for, like, expressions of our First Amendment rights, right? Um, when those are, so in the context of that quote, I use it as a way to say, who gets to define what a legitimate emphasis of, or expression, I'm sorry, of First Amendment rights when you are um, trying to express how, um, you know the 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 extreme oppression of a community is right so the 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 master's tools right this whole issue of what is a legitimate expression of first amendment rights right because when that expression when that amendment was was written the people who are expressing weren't even considered people at the time right so how can we use that tool to then frame a a an uprising right and then a uh, cause some sort of um, misinformation about what those people are, uh, the people in the streets, so, so I say those people, the people who are protesting, right, what that is actually about. Again, we have to be careful now, right, because all of the, our language has been commandeered and weaponized, so you have to be very, very careful with how we talk about this stuff. So that's, that's what I was meaning, um, and I, I think that quote is just a wonderful example of what we are witnessing right now, because there are lots of people who are missing the message because they're not, and I say this in quote, doing it right, right? But when you think about the images that we all learned and saw um, it, about the, the uprising around desegregation, right? Was that the right way? 
and we, we, we forget about that, right? That's all. Thank you so much for that um, reminder, and I think um, that lesson, and I think that um, defining, if you're defining someone else's experience, you know, that's what I heard uh, in what you were saying. Certainly, could be could be a master's tool. Right? When you think about um, that colonialist mindset, I think defining has, it plays a crucial role. And I think Laura made many, many, many comments about who's going to define her and her experience. So uh, uh, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but that's what I can take. Can everyone hear, I hear the bell? Uh, yes, I think that means <laughs> oh, nice. um, So <gasps> I've been promising to try to keep these things to one hour. So is there any one last quick question? Otherwise, we should wrap this up. Okay, I got big question. It'd take another half hour, so I'm, I'll we'll talk later. <laughs> but okay. right now, I just, Dr. Bross, thank you so much. This is awesome. Thanks to everyone for showing up and being so thoughtful and, and your comments and questions. Uh, see y'all. See you all in the chat. Yeah, the questions were great. Thanks, everyone. Um, thanks again, Dr. Bross. We'll be in touch. Much sure. appreciated. Thank you. Sure. Bye bye. Goodbye, everyone.